the experience of the Port of Cancer. Please welcome Dr. Uh, Lisa Schuster. Thank you very much, and it's actually very difficult to follow Rafour, who spoke very eloquently uh, about some of the problems. Um, before I go on to the presentation, I want to point out that AMASO, which we um, created uh, some years ago, is an extremely small organization. It's Rafour and half of one other person. They receive no official grants. They depend very much on the support of campaigners and volunteers across Europe. Um, we have together made a number of applications for funding, all of which have been rejected, largely because, um, as a matter of principle, we refuse to make one of the goals preventing irregular migration, since as there is no regular way to apply for asylum, that would be to completely undercut the whole notion of asylum. Um, Khafour's work is nonetheless really important because there is no one else. And that's extraordinary and very difficult. From the perspective of the Afghan government, for example, in 2016, there were one million people forcibly returned from Iran and Pakistan. So to be frank, the hundreds that are being returned from Europe are not a high priority. And so they are left to starve, basically, or re-migrate, as I will try and show. What I wanted to do today very quickly is to establish my credibility because that's very important when you write expert reports and to say a bit about the whole notion of credibility in uh, the asylum courts. Mm -hmm. A little bit about what we don't know, the problems with the decision making that lead to deportation and assumptions about what happens post deportation and what actually happens post deportation. Um, in terms of credibility, the reason that I say this is that I've had the experience of having uh, my experience dismissed as not really knowing what I was talking about because it was just very small samples of people. However, as I think Bill mentioned earlier, there are very few foreign researchers left in Afghanistan. And as both Bill and Anders mentioned, instead the reports that are coming out are very often written by people who are safely ensconced behind compound walls and three or four airlocks. And that has implications. So I began my work in Kabul in, uh, in Afghanistan in 2012 with a research project that was specifically designed to fill the gap in our knowledge about what happened to the people who were being deported. And as part of that, I spent three months uh, living with a family in Pula um, in the north of Afghanistan, in Baghlan. And luckily, the family spoke no European languages, so I was forced to learn uh, to speak Dari. But I'm ashamed to say that I make very many mistakes when I do. Um, I also spent three months in Kabul. The people that I was interviewing and observing were individuals who had been returned to Afghanistan, but also the families of those who had returned, most of whom had subsequently left. Um, unwilling to return after the project finished, I managed to find some work at the Afghanistan Center at Kabul University, currently being uh, directed by um, Abdul Wahid Wafa, um, where I became a research manager. And my goal then was to try and train some Afghan researchers who could themselves become experts and scholars in migration, especially forced migration. In 2016, I began another project, which was not directly looking at deportation, but um, all of this bleeds into one and informs knowledge about uh, the situation of returnees. That project was in three parts. Uh, one part of it had two uh, young Afghan researchers who recruited 18 families, six Pashto, uh, six Hazara, five Tajik, and one Sikh. And they followed these families over a period of a year, discussing with them their hopes and fears and plans for the future. Unfortunately, the head of one of the families was killed in an explosion in May, just after the project, which was very difficult for the research team. Um, the other part of the project was looking at Afghan migration policy and the influence of the EU, which I'm not going to talk about today, nor am I going to talk about what, for me, was one of the most beautiful parts of the project, 
which was looking at representations of migration in Dubaiti and in Landai, which are uh, forms of poetry in Afghanistan. So um, just very briefly, part of the reason for that initial project in 2012 was that, um, as Warris mentioned, I've been focusing on European uh, asylum policy, and in particular since 2005 on deportation. But it struck me that precisely in those countries where knowledge about what happened post-deportation was most urgent, i.e. countries in conflict, there was nothing. Um, the European Returns Directive provides for monitoring leading up to deportation, monitoring during deportation, and it suggests that there is a need for post-return monitoring, but there is nothing. And so what you find is that the gap is being filled, filled by NGOs such as Amnesty International, such as the Refugee Support Network in the UK, very small groups who go to Afghanistan and try to follow up what happens to those who've been returned. And as far as I know, in all cases, because there is nobody else, Rafur ends up being the gatekeeper to these people. So there is a real issue there about provision for those who are being returned. Okay, very briefly, very crudely, what happens to people after they're deported? As Rafur mentioned, some reintegrate. I've now spoken to over 150 people who have returned to Afghanistan, and I've met five, and I count Ab uh, Abdul as one of them, who have successfully reintegrated. With the exception of Rafur, the other four were people who had families in Kabul, and those families had the resources to be able, in one case, to send them back to university, and in other cases, to establish them in a small mobile phone shop or in other businesses. Rafur managed to reintegrate to a country in which he had not lived previously because he grew up in Pakistan. I hope he, he doesn't mind me talking about him. Um, but he managed to survive because of your work, because of the work of act activists who contacted him to ask for help for other people and who also offered him support. Having said that, aside from this tiny minority that I have seen reintegrate, most will remigrate. Underlining again what Rafur has said. What we found in that research in 2012 to 2013 was 80% of those who were forcibly returned remigrated within two years. That gap is getting shorter now, and as Rafur says, it's within months. And they remigrate largely relying on the funds sent to them by supporters in Europe or by family members in Iran or in Pakistan or in Australia or elsewhere. The reasons that they remigrate is that for many of those people, in spite of having their asylum claim rejected, the reasons that caused them to flee in the first place remain unchanged or have become worse. In addition to the reasons that initially caused them to move, there are now new reasons to, to remigrate. Most of these people have either borrowed money in order to leave and now find themselves back with, as Rafur graphically described, not a penny in their pocket, so no way to repay the debt. In other cases, they've effectively, the family has effectively mortgaged land or a home in order to pay for their, uh, their movement out of the country. In the, my time in Pul Khomri, the one of the families that I was staying with, the father of the family was beaten up in the street because the person that he had borrowed the money from to send his son out of the country, he couldn't repay that money. The son was in detention and was unable to find any way to earn the money to send it back. So after three years, the family who had loaned the money, who now needed it in order to pay for a wedding, which is extremely important, it's not as trivial as it sounds here, um, were demanding that the money be back. And in the way that Anders described, a small uh, local gathering was arranged with the white beards from the neighborhood who effectively told the man, the family that I was living with, you have to sell your home. You can buy a smaller home and you can give the money to this family. And they arranged which home was going to be sold and which home was going to be bought. 
the weight, the, the inability to repay the debt and the impact that this has on the whole family and on the life and future of brothers, sisters, younger children cannot be underestimated and creates a huge pressure on the young man to remigrate again. The other reason that people remigrate is because of the stigma and contamination that is attached to them, either because of their failure to get papers and to make a life in Europe and to be an insurance for the rest of the family or because of assumptions that are made about the fact that they have become contaminated. When somebody returns to Afghanistan voluntarily or forcibly and they end up in the family home in Kabul or in the village, within the first few days, within the very first one or two days, the word will spread like wildfire, with or without telephones, and people will start to come. From early morning, from 6 o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, there will be knocks on the door and the neighbors will be coming in to say, hello, how are you, how's it going, how was life there? And at one level they want to find out what was it like and what happened, why are you back and are you back willingly? And if you are back willingly, where are all the presents? that you would bring if you were coming back willingly. If you've come back with empty pockets, what's going on? But they're also looking, how has he changed? Has he become kafir? Do you, I wonder if he has had drunk alcohol. I wonder if he has had girlfriends. Would he be a suitable match for my daughter or no? I can't tell about him anymore because there was this period of time when there was nobody monitoring his behavior. So I don't know if he's a good boy or not anymore. So there are lots of assumptions and stigma that attach to the returnees. The other reason that people leave again is because very often they have established links, effective links. They have friends, and in some cases girlfriends or children, left in Europe that they need to go back to, that they must go back to. They have very quickly <coughs> I'm sure it's not only Afghans, but certainly amongst the Afghans that I know, they are very good at implicating themselves in the lives of society. They want to integrate. They find friends and family. And those friends and family exercise pressure on them to return, whether the friends and family are actually blood relatives or fictive relatives. Of course, there is another small minority, but nonetheless important who don't survive. And in particular, in the last two years, we have seen those who have been, amongst those who have been for forcibly returned, a small number who have been killed. If they've gone back into the provinces, we don't know about them. Most of those that we know about had links. It's only a handful, but it has happened. Others become destitute. That is, they have nothing. And when they have nothing, they disappear and they become invisible because they don't have the money to pick up a telephone and call and ask Khafur for help. They disappear into the society. Or they gather under this huge, huge colony that exists under Polosochta Bridge in the west of Kabul, which is like something from Dante's Inferno. The stink is horrific. And they sleep, defecate, survive under this bridge, dulling the pain, not just actual pain, but the agony of failure and the shame of their failure with heroin and opium. And a certain small group are recruited by insurgents or by Daesh. These are those who feel that they have no other choice. One of the people that Khafur interviewed was calling him and saying, Khafur, give me an alternative. I'm here in Nangahar and they're saying, join us. We will give you money. We will give you a salary. We will look after you. Give me an alternative. And he couldn't. And he had to break contact because it was too dangerous. Khafur mentioned those who went to Syria. Amongst our group of... Uh, 18 families. I had a 14-year-old boy who had made the attempt to cross the border at Sabul and been returned by the Iranian forces and was busy trying to get the money together to leave again to join the Fatamayun, the brigade that would go to fight in Syria. 
turning to the process that sees those people being deported. One of the things that I find most worrying, aside from many concerns I have about the decision-making process, is the real failure of those charged with making decisions about the impact of trauma on young people. There is actually a huge library of works, especially in psychology, on the impact of trauma on somebody's capacity to narrate their life story. At the moment, I'm working on the case of a young man who was already traumatized leaving Afghanistan. His family sent him away aged 13 because they wanted him to be safe. He arrived into Iran and was raped in the San Safid detention center by Iranian uh, security forces. He was then deported back to Afghanistan. Of course, he didn't disclose to anybody. And as a result, his family decided they need to send him abroad again. Aged 13 and a half, almost 14, he was picked up by three smugglers in Calais and kept for a month in a tent and servicing them before they allowed him to continue to England. And when he was interviewed in England, he was found to have lied. Of course he lied. Everything for him was a lie. The truth was too difficult. And unable to understand what would bring him safety, he was offering again and again the story that the smugglers told him would get him safety. Even now, and I have known him five years, it's not possible to persuade him to tell the truth of his story to try and access um, asylum. The other problem in the asylum process is this notion of sufficiency of protection. So I write expert reports for young uh, Afghan asylum seekers, and in every re refusal letter that I have read so far, I read that there is a sufficiency of protection in Afghanistan. Why didn't you go to the police? The police in Afghanistan at the moment, curiously enough, are not overtly concerned with the affairs of little people. They're trying to find those suicide attackers that are trying to make their way into Kabul. As a senior member of the Afghan security forces explained to me, Lisa, we're trying to protect the security of the country and of the districts. We don't have time to bother with individuals unless they can pay, exactly as Ander said. And if you can pay, you can overturn any decision anyway. The reality is that outside of Kabul, most of the Afghan local police are former militia that were hired by warlords and then subsequently given a uniform. And currently there is a proposal that has come from the American uh, government, the US government, that actually what we need are another 30,000 militia. But Human Rights Watch, and UNAMA themselves have documented evidence of the abuses perpetrated by local police, by the security forces, who exploit their position to extort money. You also have this notion that, and I've read this in papers, that actually Afghanistan is a huge country, actually large tracts of Afghanistan are uninhabited, with a population of 30 million. Again, as Anders pointed out, there hasn't been a census. We don't actually know how many people live in Afghanistan, especially with the churn that we have seen as people have left and come back and left and come back. The further argument is that Kabul is a large anonymous city. You can just go back and you can, you can disappear. You can't disappear in Afghanistan because you cannot exist as a single individual. Even me as a foreigner, when I get accommodation, I get accommodation because somebody will go and vouch for me. Somebody will go to a landlord and say, yes, she's a foreign woman, but she knows how to behave. She knows the language. She won't attract any attention for you. We will vouch for her. We live near. Without that kind of reference system, without those recommendations, there is no way that you will find accommodation. Because if I have a block of flats, for example, and there are more and more of those being built in Kabul, if I have a block of flats with families in it, I don't want a group of single young men who may be drinking, who may be taking drugs, who may bother my women folk. So I'm not going to rent to them, not unless they can afford to pay me six months rent in advance. 
UNHCR guidelines specify that you should only return somebody, for example, to Kabul, if they have social networks, if they can access accommodation, if they can access employment, and if there is a sufficiency of infrastructure. We know that many of those who make their way to Europe are actually coming having been born and or grown up in Iran or Pakistan. They no longer have social networks in Afghanistan. Or if they have, those networks have been stretched very, very thin. And because of the economic situation in the country, people are no longer able to offer the hospitality that they might once have. And because of the breakdown in trust due to 40 years of conflict, people are not as open or as willing <coughs> to be able to uh, host people. So accommodation is a very serious problem. And yes, the slums are growing around Kabul. And in those slums, there are no water. But even in the center of Kabul, um, Polosoch, Kartusei is a ser is, are areas that both Bill and Anders know very well. One of my researchers has had to move out of her apartment because there is no more water in that building. And what water there is, is now contaminated. So you have people having to buy water. Now that's fine for expats like me. 50 cents is not very much. But for a family that may survive on 50 cents a day, that's a huge amount. <coughs> In terms of unemployment, it's the same thing. You cannot, get you cannot get employment in Afghanistan unless you know somebody. And when that reaches to the Ministry of Defense and you have been people who are being given positions as generals who've never served in the army, it's a clear indication that there is a huge problem with accessing employment for those who are actually qualified. And finally, in terms of infrastructure, Kabul has exploded from a city of 500,000 people when the uh, international forces first went in, to now a city of 7 million people. The population has been swollen, not just by the normal rural to urban migration that has occurred, but by, for example, the return of a million people from Pakistan and Iran who cannot return to their home provinces, either because they no longer have land there, or because there's still a problem with an ongoing feud, or simply because the level of security there is, is, is much too low. So they cannot go back, but health hasn't kept place. Actually, in Afghanistan, there are, or in Kabul, there are hundreds of hospitals, just as there are hundreds of schools. Many of those hospitals have bright, shiny equipment, which nobody is qualified to use. The standards of hygiene are very poor. Unfortunately, and, and really sadly, given the needs in Afghanistan, the qualifications of the medical staff are, with some exceptions, I stress this, with some exceptions, very low. And that goes from the highest to the lowest. In terms of mental health, given the high level of mental health problems in Afghanistan, and especially amongst those who are forcibly returned, many of whom are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, but others who are forcibly returned suffering from schizophrenia, from hallucinations, from very severe depression and anxiety. There are three psychiatrists in Afghanistan. <laughs> There is an organization called Ipsos, which is funded by the German government. Ipsos is training community psychotherapists, but they are not properly trained psychologists. They cannot cope with the level of trauma that is suffered by many of the people who are being returned. And it's not appropriate. There is a big problem with medication. Much of the medication that comes in from Pakistan is counterfeit or is beyond the sell-by date. And given a population that is illiterate, and certainly illiterate in an alphabet that is not Arabic, it's very difficult for people to understand the quality of the medication that they're taking, aside from the, the fact that they don't also understand how these medications should be taken. In terms of sanitation, those of us who spent time in Kabul will know very well that come March when the rains come, the streets turn into stinking open sewers as the drains simply explode. And therefore, there is a real problem in terms of all of the diseases that are waterborne and airborne. But post-2014, it gets even worse. What you see after 2014 and the national unity government 
is you see a massive, a massive increase in insecurity across the country, and especially in Kabul. The idea that somehow Kabul is a safe place to which to return people is laughable. Kabul saw the highest number of casualties last year, and it's up there as one of the top two highest countries this year. But in response to the increase in insecurity, what you have is a wholesale retreat to Green Village. This is the area out the Nangarhar Road, the Jalalabad Road, which is lined with these compounds. Now UNHCR has moved out there. Most of the big interna the international community organizations are now out on this road. UNHCR offices now look like a giant high security prison that you would find in the US. It's extremely difficult to access any of the people who work there. Inside Kabul, where there still exist embassies, the consular staff have been dismissed. So you have, for example, in the European Union delegation, which used to have a staff of 34, now reduced to 10. With the result that nobody in Afghanistan can apply in Afghanistan for a visa to come to Europe. You have, first of all, to apply for a visa to go to Pakistan or India or Iran. You have to have enough money to pay for the visa, to pay for your flight tickets, and to pay to stay in one of those countries up to three weeks while you wait for a decision on your visa. So getting out of Afghanistan legally is simply not possible. One of the results of this now highly securitized environment is that it's much harder for the Taliban or for insurgents or for Daesh to attack compounds. So what do they do? They attack the convoys. They attack the vehicles on the streets. And the collateral damage are the ordinary citizens who can't sit behind a wall, who can't sit in an armed car. <clears throat> if you look at the casualties that have happened in the last two years, very many of them the overwhelming majority of them have been ordinary people who have been in the wrong place and the wrong time. The problem is the wrong places and the wrong times are exponentially increasing so that it becomes almost impossible to avoid it. And as was said earlier today, when we did the interview with our 18 families, which came to more than 100 individuals, every single one of the women in those families Every single one of those women, Pashtun, Tajik, Hazara, Sikh, said, we are terrified every morning when our husbands go out to work and our children go to school. Whenever there is an incident, we're trying to call them. Where are you? Are you safe? Come home. And amongst the families that we interviewed, a number of those women had actually persuaded their husbands to give up work or were keeping their children home from school. One of my research colleagues, has pulled her six-year-old son out of school. These are people for whom education seemed to be the only way out, but now it's just too dangerous. This has a huge impact. Aside from the people who are killed and injured, who, as was pointed out this morning, may be supporting up to 15 people, perhaps more, you have the psychological impact, the fact that people are afraid to go out into the streets. When I talk to my research team now on Skype or on Facebook and ask them how it's going, they are increasingly staying at home because the risk of going to market, of going to mosque, of going to an educational center is too great. So there is this pervasive atmosphere of fear and it shouldn't be underestimated. And this, of course, has an impact on the economy. The withdrawal of the international security forces and the international community meant that many of those people who, like the two families that Anders described this morning, relied on that community for work, don't have that work anymore. They're sitting at home or they're working for much less money. One of the other interesting things that's happened with this retreat into Green Village, this secure area, is that there is a huge lack of trust. It's not possible if you run out of oil for cooking to just nip out to the shops. These are now brought in by private logistics companies from Turkey or, or somewhere else. 
So, of course, none of that money is going into the local economy. This loss of trust and fear means that there has been a very serious retreat into social networks. If I can give an example in a ministry with which I worked closely, the minister was from one particular group. The people around him were all from the same group. All of them had grown up in Iran. The deputy minister was from Nangahar. Not only was he from Nangahar, he's from Sohrad. All of the people, all of the people around him were not only from the same ethnic group, not only from the same province, but they were all from the same district. Because this is the only way you can keep yourself safe. Now that's a real problem, exactly as Bill pointed out. If over centuries, for example, the Hazara were excluded from these positions of power. So even if you've gone to school, even if you have enthusiastically grasped the opportunities that the end of the Taliban era offered you, you still have no chance of actually getting a real job, apart from a small handful. What this does is it, create, it exacerbates the nepotism. It's also led to an increasing loss of faith in the future. That project that I've been working on for two years, when we began in 2016 and we started talking to people about their hopes for the future, they did have hopes. They varied in, in magnitude, but they had hopes. Two years in, those hopes had shrunk to almost nothing. When we began, we recruited 18 families. We didn't talk about migration. We recruited 18 families, saying that we wanted to recruit people according to ethnicity and income groups to make sure that we got a spread. When we asked them, when it came out, when we analyzed the data, we discovered that four of them were actively thinking about migrating. By the end of the project, or by the end of the data collection period in January this year, 14 of them were now thinking about going. And that's knowing. All of them spoke about the experiences that other family members had had, and they were fully aware of how difficult the journey was going to be. What you've also seen is an increase in crime. Dashi Barchi in the west of Kabul, as was pointed out by Rafour, used to be, until about two years ago, one of the safest, quietest places in Kabul. It was a place that I, as a foreign woman, even though I was wearing uh, appropriate clothing, I felt comfortable strolling around Barchi. A few months ago, I went back to go for a, a school day at Maktab Marafat, a very, very good school in the area. And I was profoundly shocked to see armored police vehicles all along the main road. When we turned off the road to go to the school, two checkpoints. As we go into the school, everybody's being checked. Because even schools, as we've seen, are targets of attack, especially in Hazara and Sheet areas. But everybody is vulnerable in Afghanistan. Something else that was mentioned this morning was the problem of drought. The drought in Afghanistan is getting particularly bad. Many of those people who are in Kabul today are coming from areas like Daikundi. So some of my colleagues have family members who are arriving into Kabul because they couldn't feed their animals. So they had sold their sheep at very low prices because everybody's selling their sheep. And without sheep, they have no income. So they're coming to Kabul. While it's true that, that, day, laborers, that day labor work is available, it's available to those who have contacts. If I come back from Europe and I've grown up in Iran or Pakistan, that 150 other people who are standing on the street corner waiting for a few jobs are not going to allow me to elbow their way, my way to the front. So that's a huge problem. The impact of all of this on those who forcibly, who've been forcibly returned is that it's much harder for them to survive, so there is much greater pressure to re-migrate. But the policies introduced by European government is making it much more difficult, much more dangerous, and much more expensive to migrate. I haven't had time because I've talked too much, I'm so sorry, to talk about the problems with the integrity of the asylum system. Because there are two arguments that are made by European governments who are insisting on deporting to Afghanistan when really they don't have to. One is that it's necessary to protect the integrity of the asylum system. The integrity of the asylum system has already been chronically, if not fatally, undermined by the reality that it's almost impossible to access by the ridiculous perspective, which I think Helen is going to talk about later, of the different recognition rates across the country. 
And secondly, there is this idea that we need deportation in order to deter others. If it was working as a deterrent, then 80% of those who had been deported would not be remigrating. I think that's it. Thank you very much. I just have one question. Sure. Um, uh, you have almost five years experience in Afghanistan and you have closely observed and studied uh, issues related with uh, deportation of Afghans from different European countries. My question to you is that after the formation of unity government with uh, President Ashraf Ghani uh, and, and uh, Chief Executive Dr. Abdullah, has there been any kind of agreement formally or informally signed between the Afghan government and the European you know it has. <laughs> if you could just, uh, because this question has been raised by many here in the audience, so I think it's very important. Okay, uh, so the joint way forward is the agreement that was eventually signed in October 2016. It was, um, so you had the, the spike in the numbers coming into Europe in 2015, and of course you had the very appropriate reaction of European governments, which was, oh, we should open our doors and allow them to come in. Only joking, only one person said that. And what you actually had was, how do we stop them coming? And so you had a proposal put to the Afghan government that they should sign this document by which they agreed to reduce irregular migration and to facilitate the returns of Afghans to Afghanistan. Um, during the negotiations, one of the numbers that was thrown out was that there were about 80,000 Afghans in Europe who would probably be eligible to be returned like this. I mean, it was a number. Um, it was signed, and it was signed uh, under huge pressure from the European Union. The um, Afghan government, uh, in particular, uh, Minister Rabani, Minister Balki, and one or two others were resisting and saying, this is, this is not appropriate, this is not the time to be returning people. Um, However, um, Angela Merkel called uh, Ashraf Ghani, uh, David Cameron called Ashraf Ghani, um, the European representative Melvin uh, shouted and screamed at uh, Afghan colleagues with whom he was supposed to be negotiating, not appropriate behavior for a diplomat, but there you go, and said, if you don't sign this document, there is no incentive for Europeans to provide development aid. Mm -hmm. And so you had the situation where four senior ministers in the government, Minister Balki, Minister Rabani, Mr. Uh, Zaki Iqlil, I think, and I can't remember offhand the fourth one, stood before the parliament and said, we don't want to sign this. We understand it's, it's not good, but we have to do it for the greater good of Afghanistan and the Afghan people, because it's not fair to deprive the Afghan people of 1.5 um, billion euros in aid for the sake of a, a few hundred people who are coming back from Europe. Right. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ben, in the last chapter. It's on. Hi, my name is Ben Darren Morgan and I work at Stockholm University and International Idea. Um, and I just wanted to ask, Afghan friends have told me before that because a huge amount of money is actually flooded into the country, then for the sort of bureaucratic elites, then there are, um, there are jobs going that are really well remunerated, right? But then you hear anecdotal evidence, like you were saying, of people living on 50 cents a day. So what, how have inequalities changed um, since 2001? And uh, what are median incomes like? What's, what's happened there? And, and Leading on from that, then, what are the uh, migration opportunities for average people financially? Can be reported on? Um, okay, to start at the end, um, if you've had the good fortune to be employed on one of these international salaries, then it becomes much easier for you to find a way out and to get a visa. Um, because, of course, in order to get a visa, you have to show that you have a contract and you have a reason to go back to Afghanistan. Um, if you don't have that, then your only opportunities for migration are going to Iran or Pakistan to find uh, low-paid work on insecure contracts, probably without any protection at all. Um, 
I first arrived in Afghanistan in, in 2011, so it's very difficult for me to judge the difference, the growth in inequality or not. My instinct is that it's grown very much, but I would leave that to Anders and Bill, who have a much longer history in Afghanistan than me. Having said that, today, the inequality is, is absolutely massive. So you have, so a naan, uh, a round bread in Kabul costs 10 Afghanis. Um, and there are families who, as I say, have 50 Afghanis to survive on. One of the, the downsides of the chronic uh, poverty is that you see lots of children, four or five years of age, selling plastic bags in the markets or selling hard-boiled eggs, um, offering to carry your, your luggage. And for that, that, somebody, a passerby might give them five Afghanis. And often these children are the ones that are bringing the money home where uh, the families are female-headed households. Um, so that, that's a real problem. But you actually have uh, the very strange situation within the ministries that you have some officials who are on normal Afghan salaries, which, which might be fine. So you might have somebody on $400 a month who's you know head of a department in a ministry. But because the um, international community has created this scheme called the Capacity Building for Results Scheme, you will have a younger person who has come in, who has a BA or a master's, that the older man who was working with the Mujahideen and has his position because of his previous experience, they come in and they're on four, uh, you know, three or four times the salary. So there, uh, even more. Uh, so there is this kind of, of inequity um, and you have these two very different populations at work not communicating inside the ministries of these young educated people with no experience very educated people with no qualifications who can't speak English. I can, can I add a little? Yeah, absolutely. Please. There's an old saying about Afghanistan. That Please give him a mic to someone. The microphone. Yeah. Can you hear me? There's an old saying about Afghanistan that poverty in Afghanistan is equally distributed. So and that's and that's from the 50s and the 40s and uh, and so and that's not the case anymore. The real rich people are the people who have been uh, and you can see it in Sharpur, uh, which was a kind of uh, countryside area, a village in Afghanistan, which was appropriated by the then vice president uh, Fahim, and he just uh, the people were, were forced off the land and. The land was appropriate, and so he first did it in his own name, but then Karzai, the president who was on a foreign tour, he came back and then he, he uh, took over the land and then it was divided up in plots and given to, to a lot of people. I know two people, only two, who refused to take plots there. But others took, and the villas you see there now is, uh, an, uh, what do you call it? Copy palaces. Yeah, well, monstrous, yeah, monstrous uh, copies of what they have seen in Dubai. Uh, so that you have these blue and green windows, and you have seven balconies and, and, and things like that. Uh, uh, palaces which are incredible. No gardens, because these people, they are rich. They have become rich on either on, on, on opium and heroin or on... on uh, and, uh, and international contracts. Yeah, international contracts and these things and so on. They don't use the balconies because if, they, if the women are coming out on the balconies, they can be seen by their neighbors, and that is, of course, forbidden and so on. So the, uh, the balconies is just there for the show. So it's, it's uh, that poverty is equally distributed is not the case anymore. You have the very, very rich in Afghanistan, and that, those are pretty few people. And then you have a, a, a big deal of the people who are very, very poor. Thank you very much, Anders, on your input. Uh, you would also like to say something? Else? Yes, I like a, 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 very, very, very briefly because we are running it. Yeah. Uh, this is one area where one needs to be very careful about statistics because figures on average income mm. in Afghanistan tend to be distorted by the fact that there are a small number of people at the top who are making an enormous amount of money. Uh, and that can create, it, it's a bit like life expectancy figures which uh, 
which are distorted because they don't recognise the bimodal character of, of the distribution of mortality. So median income is actually a much better uh, indicator of how income is located in Afghanistan than average income. So whenever you see a figure on, uh, that says ah, average incomes are soaring in Afghanistan, watch out because it's probably designed to mislead. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor William Mele. We have um, one more question there, and last question will be here. Yeah. So, yeah, you have the mic. Okay, good. Thank Please. you. Uh, my name is Ronika Selmark, and I'm a, a lobbyist, activist, and politician. Uh, I think this is extremely interesting, and uh, I would like to hear a little bit more about the the deportations and what happens once you come back to Afghanistan. I understand the situation in the country have a lot of difficulties and challenges. It's not uh, only post-deportation, it's about security, it's land rights, it's everything. But uh, what, what are the reasons that there are no support whatsoever from, from aid agencies, the international community, or the government in Afghanistan to support uh, the forced <laughs> uh, deportations. Like, why is why is no organization having any sort of program to integrate, to support, to help these people that are forced to 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 deport, uh, basically? So, so I would li like to hear a little bit more on on what is this discussion there. Why is no one having any support? Thanks. Uh, Dr. Lisa, if you could just answer very briefly because sure. it's a very sure. important issue and then we can uh, touch on this issue later in the panel discussion too. Perfect. Yeah. Um, very briefly, part of the reason is, as I mentioned earlier, this, the difference in scale between those who are being forcibly returned from Pakistan and Iran, which is a much, much higher number. So whatever uh, assistance is being provided by the World Food Programme, UNHCR, IOM, uh, World Bank, a uh, whole range of people are being focused on these large number of people who are settling in Nangahar, uh, Lahman, Kabul, and uh, Herat or Mazar. Um, so numerically, the numbers being deported back from Afghanistan are just not su significant enough for the Afghan for the international community to focus on them. And there's a big issue there that I can happily discuss afterwards to do with development. But the other issue is. IDPs, returnees and refugees are the responsibility of the Ministry for Refugees and Repatriation. This is the poorest and weakest ministry in the entire Afghan government, which is extraordinary given the numbers involved uh, across the country. Um, they just don't have the, res the resources. And not this minister, but under the previous minister, there was a real issue of corruption. And so a lot of things stopped under his uh, regime because um, there was a big scandal about funds being uh, diverted. But I'm, I'm happy to talk more about this afterwards. Yes, here. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mariam Safi. I'm from Afghanistan and I work with International IDEA. Uh, thank you for the pre presentation. Uh, my uh, question is about integration. Given the facts and the evidence that you have presented, do you think integration of the deportees or returnees is possible in Afghanistan? Only if the families exist in the country, in, in, in particular in Kabul, and if they have resources. Otherwise, not really. And you can see this as well with the returnees coming back from Iran, who also have problems. And uh, I have, sorry, I have one more question. It's short. What do you think about the aid management in Afghanistan? The money is sent by the name of aid in Afghanistan. And uh, we can see like yesterday there was the news that 70% uh, of the women empowerment aid was uh, spent for the salaries and the good life of the people who works there. I think this is a very broad issue. I would just like to interrupt here. And we have uh, speakers here who are expert, almost everyone on this issue. Issue, and we will definitely touch upon this issue during the panel discussion. So thank you very much. Uh, let's have a round of applause for Dr. <laughs>